Good afternoon once again, and a warm welcome to parliamentarians and staff who have joined us here again for the third week of the Africa Center's annual Parliamentarians Forum. I hope everyone is well. My name is Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly. I'm Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center and faculty lead for this program. And so in this capacity, let me welcome you once again. Thank you for coming. And I will spend just a few minutes summarizing what we learned last week before we turn to our panel for this week. Um, before I do though, I wanted to highlight some resources that some of you shared with us last week that we feel that everyone in our group um, should be able to see. Um, and so with the permission of those um, who shared those resources in the chat, you will see links to four different documents. All of these are resources that were written by parliamentarians in this program or that are articles about some of the work that parliamentarians in this program are doing. Um, so there is a report about oversight of the police in South Africa. There is a piece about the role of parliament in the budget process in Namibia. There's some reporting on the work of Democratic Republic of Congo's Defense and Security Committee. And um, someone also shared with us Ghana's recent right to information law that came up in some of our discussion, um, discussions of independent information and its importance in legislative oversight. So our, we'll be pasting those resources and the links in case that's of interest to um, colleagues in the room today. And let me just suggest if there are other tools, articles, or resources that you as a staff member or a member of parliament are producing as part of your work and you want to share it with other colleagues in this forum, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and let us know. We're happy to facilitate that exchange of resources. So um, one major aspect we heard about last week and that we'll build upon this week was how the security and defense budgeting cycle should fit into the broader budget cycle within a country. So Dr. Willeen discussed the five stages of the budget cycle, and they're worth remembering here as we move into discussions of transparency this week. So there's first the setting of macro fiscal objectives. So that means understanding the resources that are available, the national objectives that motivate expenditure across sectors. And ideally, legislators would be involved in some of these pre-budget debates, as many of you mentioned. So that's the first phase we discussed. The second was about budget preparation and resource allocation. So this is when ministries prepare and negotiate the budget, allocate resources, ideally in relation to strategy and set policies, and seek legislative approvals after ideally the legislature reviews these proposals. The third stage we discussed in the cycle was budget execution with parliamentarians monitoring actual expenditures and revenues. The fourth stage was oversight and reporting, including calling executive branch officials to account for their expenditures that were allocated by the legislature. And it also involves legislators reacting to the results of reports that are produced by audit institutions. And then the fifth stage in this cycle was performance evaluation looking at the effectiveness or the efficiency of the allocations that were executed and using those results then to again inform strategy and the macro fiscal allocations for the next year. So this is all pictured in one of the resources on the syllabus, the book called Securing Development, which is available in French and in English. Um, and Dr. Willeen walked us through that slide that some of you who were there last week might remember that pictured all of these different elements of the cycle. So within this cycle, there is a security sector strategic planning that legislators are important stakeholders in, and that should influence security sector budget and resource allocation, security sector budget execution, and then the specialized monitoring and evaluation of the performance of different defense and security sector programs. So um, for more information on the technicalities of all of that, uh, the securing development resource by the uh, World Bank is listed on the syllabus and could be a really useful resource. We also found that parliamentary allocations for defense and security budgets are ideally configured to help the country's security sector meet national security objectives in the most effective way possible. And because parliamentarians are representatives of the people, their oversight of this can also help to ensure that national security strategies and their implementation reflect not only state and regime interests, but also the interests of constituents and citizens. So if a country has a national security strategy, it's important for legislators to be involved in shaping the strategy itself, and then in assessing the defense budgets 
with the strategy itself in mind. So some of you noted in our discussions last week that the prime minister's opening speech for parliament or the president's yearly speech outlining general national policy priorities can also be critical resources that legislators and their staff can use in their work. In fact, the budget itself can be treated by legislators and their staff as a policy statement that they're reacting to. That said, the process of oversight does not necessarily have to be a confrontational one, as some of you mentioned. And as our presenter, Mr. Cole, mentioned last week, there are informal ways that parliamentarians can engage with their colleagues, say in the finance ministry or other parts of the executive branch, to gather information on where the country is in the budget process, what aspects of the budget or policy the executive is trying to emphasize through the budget. And those informal relationships that Mr. Cole mentioned and talked about at length can help legislators prepare their oversight strategies. It can help legislators fulfill their constitutional roles in this process. So both formal and informal modes of engagement at different parts of the budget cycle and in the broader strategy making process matter, um, as many of you already know and echoed in our discussion groups. Finally, I will end by saying some of the other readings from last week's syllabus give a short overview of all of this, or they're providing guidance on these issues specifically to people who are members of a country's defense and security committee. These resources also give some practical recommendations on ways for parliament, parliaments to strengthen defense and security oversight more generally. The International Parliamentary Union document, <laughs> excuse me, um, gives some general, 28 general recommendations that could be worth looking at. A few of the things that they mention, allocating time and plenary for oversight, publishing parliamentary documents about analysis that can inform oversight, bringing expert witnesses to parliamentary sessions to inform the scrutiny of budgets, um, seeking out technical or expert advice from internal oversight bodies like the Court of Auditors, considering allowing MPs to serve on the same committee like the Defense Committee multiple times to allow them to build up some expertise that they start using, or having uh, members of the Defense and Security Committee who must leave the committee or cycle out write reports that transfer institutional memory to others when they do leave those committees. And uh, importantly, this was a common theme that you all discussed quite a bit, finding ways to use cross party and single party caucuses or other elements to challenge certain policy positions or to engage in oversight. So there's a lot to continue discussing. I hope that this panel this week will help us continue some of these um, debates and continue to share resources and experiences with one another. So I am pleased with that to be a moderator of this third panel. It's entitled Accountability, Fostering Security Sector Professionalism and Transparency. I will now be joined on the dais by Dr. Michael Afore Mensa, Dr. Emil Wadrogo, and Ms. Kemi Okunyodo. The plenary panel has the following objectives today. We hope to analyze approaches and tools that parliamentarians have to foster security force professionalism, and how best they can use those tools to address security force breaches of conduct. We also hope to analyze approaches and tools that parliamentarians have to ensure fiscal transparency and transparency in security and defense procurements and discuss how best they can use those tools to prevent corruption and promote good governance in the sector. And finally, we're hoping to highlight the role played by transparency and accountability of the security forces uh, in the delivery of security and justice to citizens. All right, if I could be joined by video when possible by our three panelists, I will introduce them now to the group. First, we have Dr. Michael Afori Mensa. He is head of research at Transparency International Defense and Security, where he leads the design and delivery of their global research agenda. He previously managed the production of the Government Defense Integrity Index for 2020. And prior to joining Transparency International Defense and Security, Michael was the Director of Research at the Institute for Economic Affairs in Ghana, where he spent eight years leading research and coordinating a broad range of projects. He has contributed to several pu public policy reform initiatives in the areas of governance and constitutional review. And he has also provided technical support to Ghana's parliament, 
which he advised on legislation like the Presidential Transition Act. We also have with us Dr. Emil Wedrogo. He's an adjunct professor of practice at the Africa Center with us, specializing in issues related to national security strategy and security sector governance. Dr. Wadrogo was a parliamentarian in the National Assembly of Burkina Faso. He was also in ECOWAS Parliament, where he sat on the Political Affairs, Peace, Defense, and Security Committees. In this capacity, he carried out various missions in most of ECOWAS's 15 different countries. He also uh, has worked with the African Union um, in a mission in Madagascar on security sector reform. He was Minister of Security of Burkina from 2008 to 2011. Um, and after 30 years of service with the Burkina Faso Army, he retired from active duty in 2012 as a colonel. He had served in positions including aide to the prime minister, support regiment commanding officer, and chief of the military intelligence division. So he brings multiple different hats, multiple experiences as a parliamentarian, as a security official, as someone from the military. Um, so welcome, Emil. Ms. Kemi Okunyoto is also joining us. She is the executive director of the Rule of Law and Empowerment Initiative, also known as Partners West Africa Nigeria. That is a non-governmental organization dedicated to enhancing citizens' participation and improving security governance in Nigeria and West Africa. She has provided technical, strategic, and programmatic leadership for the Nigeria Policing Program, which was working with policing providers, government, and civil society for accountable policing services in Nigeria. She has also provided support to the uh, West Africa Conflict Security and Stabilization Unit on transition from military operations to a stabilized community policing approach in the northeastern part of Nigeria. She also previously served uh, as a team lead on other justice sector reform and police accountability projects over the course of her 15 years of experience on these issues on the NGO side of the house. She is also notably an alumna of the Africa Center and she's the secretary general of the Africa Center's Nigeria alumni chapter. So welcome to all three panelists. I'm going to start our discussion with Dr. Ofori Mensa. Dr. Ofori Mensa, could you discuss what the data tells us about current trends related to corruption in the defense sector in Africa, and how does military ownership of private or civilian ventures affect the degree of defense and security sector transparency? If you could spend six or seven minutes reflecting on that for us, that would be a great way to start us off. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly, and good day, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. There is interesting data on the state of defense governance as a whole and corruption risk. Um, let me let's start by drawing on the Government Defense Integrity Index, which is produced by Transparency International Defense and Security to answer this question. Uh, but just a short background, uh, the Government Defense Integrity Index, the GDI, assesses the existence, enforcement, and effectiveness of institutional controls to manage the risk of corruption in defense and security institutions. And it is premised on the idea that better institutional controls reduce the risk of corruption. It is produced every five years. And the most recent iteration um, that covered 86 countries around the world was published last year. Uh, just to reemphasize that the GDI does not measure corruption. It is a corruption risk assessment tool. And a full disclosure, I managed the production of the last situation, um, like Dr. Kelly mentioned, so I feel very passionate about it. Uh, the effective state institutions play a pivotal role in preventing waste of public funds, the abuse of power and fraud within defenses, defense and security institutions. And as a result, they are the focus of this index. And the index focuses on financial risk, personal risk, political risk, procurement risk, and operational risk. And the type of institutions that are assessed range from parliamentary defense committees and finance committees, uh, ministries of defense, supreme audit institutions, 
uh, the proc procurement agencies and tender boards, military owned businesses and information commissions. And in undertaking the index, we compile a wide range of evidence um, and provide a detailed assessment of integrity within these uh, national defense institutions. And thereafter, countries are scored and placed in a band to determine the level of corruption risk. Having provided this background, let me just move on to answer the question here. So drawing on the latest situation of the index, we covered 16 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'll answer my question based on the evidence of that. The evidence that emerges from this provides a sobering picture of corruption risk in Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole, and in particular, the defense sector. The overall GDI score for the 16 countries covered was 24 over 100, which again means that this, the average points to a very high risk of corruption. And it's worth, again, just noting that uh, out of these 16 countries, only South Africa um, basically was a country scored or placed in the category of moderate risk. The rest ranged from high to very critical risk of corruption. Now I'm picking the data. I can just point quickly to a few issues. First, it points to the fact that democratic oversight of the defense sector is facing challenges across a wide variety of contexts. Countries in the region uh, with strong formal rights, uh, where parliaments are given in, uh, the powers of scrutiny, uh, still consistently failed to take advantage of their oversight powers or simply did not debate or review defense policy at all. And a variety of factors emerge as possible explanations. And one would be uh, populist driven executive overreach, uh, strong party affiliations that blur the lines of oversight, lack of expertise and staffing to support parliamentarians and uh, compromised information flows uh, between ministries and the legislature. We found that, that the legislative committees in several instances were not being provided with information relating to spending on secret items. But it's also important to put all of this in context. Defense spending is rising in the region, uh, but institutional capacity is lacking. And one very prominent institution that compiles evidence of defense spending is the Stockholm International Peace Research Institution, um, that's CIPRI. And CIPRI uh, notes that military expenditure in Sub-Saharan Africa increased by 3.4% um, in 2022, reached 18.5 billion. So it's very important to put everything in context, rising defense expenditure um, and lacking oversight. Moving to the second part of your question, uh, how do formal uh, in institutions and informal institutions, as well as uh, military, you know, ownership of private sector, affect the degree of defense and security uh, transparency? This is quite interesting because defense institutions are involved in the private sector, and to a large degree their significant involvement in commercial activity has resulted in what, if I may say, repurposing of the defense organizations themselves away from the provision of security into the provision of profits. Defense ownership or what, what we believe to be defense ownership of uh, commercial businesses in some countries are major enterprises. And sadly, some of these businesses are not declared and are wholly non-transparent. If I could just zero down into one very critical area, and that's natural resource exploitation. 
we realize that in sub-Saharan Africa, there are countries where military involvement in natural resource exploitation from what we gauge in the index is classified as very high to critical risk in eight of those 16 countries that we assess. Therefore, this means that there are very few controls, if any, um, of these interests being subjected to scrutiny and uh, the, the financial records of some of these military owned businesses are not even audited by you know, Supreme Audit of um, Supreme Audit bodies. This in turn, you know, coupled with what I just mentioned um, with the lack of expertise that may exist within some parliamentary um, committees, basically means that civilian oversight is undermined and defense sectors in the region continue to benefit from what we characterize as defense exceptionalism, where they are exempted from the broad range of regulations. So overall, I think this tends to undermine defense sector governance as a whole and poses serious challenges for defense corruption risk. Thank you so much um, for covering so much ground in so little time, Dr. Michael. Um, I think that really helps us. The CIPRI data, in addition to the defense, uh, the GDI data are useful resources potentially for our parliamentarians and staff and the audience. And I think hearing from you um, exactly how those tools are intended to be used and then your assessment of some of the broad trends um, or broad challenges in the sector that um, people could think about and look at while they're, they're looking at the data as well is really helpful to start us off. Let me follow up, if I may, with one more question for you. Um, and I'll give you seven minutes or so again to talk about this. What kinds of measures might parliamentarians then consider taking to address corruption in the defense and security sector? Um, and particularly, what tools and techniques do you think they might need to use to bridge these gaps between law and practice on transparency in the defense and security sector on the fiscal front? Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, could I just start off by saying that um, I'm sure later on you can share the resources from the GDI with the uh, parliamentarians and staff uh, who are present here with us today. I think you have quite a bit packed into the second question, but if I could just start by saying that um, what kind of measures my parliamentarians consider, I think the starting point would be to emphasize that context matters very much here. The causes and manifestations of defense corruption risk vary uh, between African countries. Therefore, the measures will have to be examined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, all the same, there may be some shared approaches, but let me try and unpick um, the issue using a case I know well. Uh, Ghana's parliament has relatively strong formal powers of oversight. However, our parliament's capacity and will to make use of them is tempered by excessive partisanship. And to some extent, this hinders the work of the legislature. Strong party cohesion has been the hallmark of Ghanaian democracy. And uh, to some extent, this stifles substantial debate and blunts oversight uh, tools. This, this is particularly uh, visible in this first sector where these features are you know, supported by an entrenched culture of not interfering with uh, defense affairs in parliament. The Parliamentary Select Committee on Defense um, and Interior is the de designated uh, defense oversight body. However, in my view, it lacks adequate expertise and capacity to effectively hold the executive to account. Of course, there are other issues uh, turnover of membership and the lack of permanent staff and specialized support staff um, also seriously undermines his work. On the positive side, the Supreme Audit Body in Ghana, the Auditor General, is empowered to scrutinize defense spending and reports biannually to Parliament. Its audits are regular, in-depth, and published online 
And uh, although it should be noted that it really focuses on performance and performance audits and produces mostly financial compliance audits. Uh, now, turning to answer your question, providing this context, it's important again to emphasize that effective measures don't just involve parliament, but it requires a whole ecosystem of key stakeholders working together. Having said that, some of the measures that could be considered would be for parliament, actually building the capacity of parliament and the support staff with the context I provided, particularly on technical aspects of defense. Defense tends to be an area where it's, you know, there are very technical issues that sometimes require specialist knowledge. So this will be key. And transparency would be the next issue. Uh, for parliament itself to actually promote this or to enforce this. Disclosure of information to enable oversight bodies to perform their functions is key. So this would be basically ensuring that the appropriate legislative committees or members of the legislature are provided with uh, the, the information on spending, particularly on secret items. That would also include detailed line items and descriptions of all expenditure types to enable them to undertake their work. Uh, the approved defense budgets should also be pro proactively published um, in disaggregated format and with explanations for both experts and unexpected to be able to undertake their work. And in the case of the Auditor General, as I mentioned, uh, producing lots of performance, uh, financial audits, I think a shift to producing more performance audits will be required. And again, that would enable Parliament to identify areas of efficiency, saving value for money, as well as corruption. So it's it, a, a whole range of um, aspects that will be required. But turning to Parliament itself um, again, and in terms of bridging the gap um, between law and practice, I think the power to scrutinize any aspect of performance of the you know, defense ministries would be key. But parliament, um, in order to bridge this gap, should, where it issues recommendations, should state a specific time frame within which that entity, whether it's a defense, um, you know, the Ministry of Defense, should basically report back on you know, the implementation of um, or uh, reacting to that action, that would be key. In many instances, we, we realize that there's no specific time frame provided and um, follow-ups are even not occurring. So that would be key. And again, uh, transparency um, and opening up the space to also engage with civil society um, would be key because um, civil society sometimes comes on board with some expertise and that bridges the gap that might be lacking you know, within parliament. It's, it's quite important to, to point out here that of the 16 countries that we assess in the GDI, 11 of these sub-Saharan African countries had no public engagement with civil society on defense matters as a whole. So that, I think that's quite, it's quite key you know, with public consultations um, on defense matters. And there should be also a clear process for the entire defense acquisition planning cycle that's in looking at procurement, which should be in place. And to ensure that there's a connection between defense purchases and the national defense security um, national you know, defense strategy or national um, uh, security policy, uh, that, that would be very important in order to uh, buttress again, uh, that is external oversight function. So parliament again, you know, it's not just about implementation of laws or, but ensuring that some of these clear processes are in place to begin with would be key. And then one final point that I, would, I really like to highlight would be, access to information. Um, in many countries that we've assessed their legislation, uh, access to information or right to information laws are in place. But 
defense seems to be exempt in some instances. In those instances, I think it's important where parliament comes, parliament comes in to actually work with the information commissioners to actually detail, you know, how public can it, you know, uh, access information in the defense sectors, where we should, what are the rules around classification? What information is and uh, is available and is not available? And, you know, again, how classified information should be categorized and how the public can appeal against some decisions where they turn this down. Um, and of course, where the information commissioner exists, should report to parliament on how the appeal process and reviewing, you know, um, you know, these appeals are undertaking. Uh, the evidence basically shows that uh, in many of these cases, there is absolutely uh, little in terms of implementation of the um, of the law, and particularly so with regards to uh, defense sector. So it's it's a multiplicity of issues and. Um, we hope that bringing all these together would basically help address some of the gaps that we've identified. Thank you so much, Dr. Afori Mensa. Um, once again, um, a, giving us a good example, a concrete example, since we have to tailor our responses, but also, um, yeah, these really concrete suggestions, um, even here at the end about information commissioners and um, them and building links to parliament. I think these are key things that I know um, we've started discussing in some of our discussion groups over the last two weeks, but um, certainly deserve further breakdown as um, our parliamentarians and staffers continue to meet each other and share information and move forward. So I'm sure uh, this will be a great jumping off point for uh, the continuation of our discussions and thank you for sharing those suggestions. Uh, now, building off of that, uh, this builds nicely to what I would like to ask Dr. Emil. So Dr. Emil, I'll turn to you now could you spend about six or seven minutes giving us some ideas based on your experience as an officer, a former parliamentarian, former minister of security? Uh, you also wrote a report for the Africa Center on military professionalism in Africa that we have on the syllabus. What are the challenges faced by parliaments in Africa to enhancing military professionalism and to making the security sector more accountable and transparent? We'll give you a couple of minutes, six or seven, to, to give us some initial thoughts on that. Thank you very much, Dr. Kat. I will speak in French. First, I would like to <coughs> apologize. Uh, no, I was a little late uh, because it's quite far from where I'm, I live. So I, uh, the connection was very good until I was able, it was not very good until um, just now. So I, I wasn't able to hear everything that Dr. Ofori Mansa said, but I, what I heard was very interesting. Thank you for this question. I think it's based on my experience that, that you noted, my, my experience as an officer. I am a retired colonel, and my experience as Minister of Security and my experience as a, a parliamentarian at the national level and also within ECOWAS. So, you know, I, I published uh, the article about the profession professionalism of armed forces in Africa. So I did that in 2014. It's been eight years. So I, I really think I need to update this article because things have evolved. Uh, things evolve very quickly on the African continent. Nevertheless, I do think that the basic principles that I noted in this document and, and that is noted in your recommended readings. I, I think these basic principles are still relevant, very relevant. And when you look at them in, in the light of what we're talking about today, this um, accountability and the professionalization and the transparency of, of security, the first principle uh, I talk about in my article is about the subordination 
of armed forces to civil authority. And when I listened to Dr. Ofori Mansa, I, 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 you know, I'll, I'll come back to this topic. The allegiance to the rule of law is another critical principle uh, for the professionalism of armed forces. And then political neutrality. It, this lack of, of it, when there is this lack of neutrality, this really impairs uh, the oversight uh, by parliament. So th these are the main principles. Uh, and as Kat noted, these are challenges. And that means that parliamentarians uh, to, to carry out their missions need to have these in mind. The, the, these basic principles must be anchored in values, values that are taken on by soldiers because it's a profession, you know, to discipline, integrity, honor, um, commitment to the service of the people and then sacrifice and, and duty. So I, I will explain uh, this. Um, Kat gave me five to seven minutes, so I'm going to explain this quickly. Why the lack of compliance with these cardinal principles has a significant impact on parliamentarians' ability uh, to conduct oversight. So let's say non-application of subordination to civil authority. This is a, a key element and a lot of security forces and defense forces are still resistant to this in many countries. In many African countries, a, a lot of uh, members of the armed forces um, push back against the application of this principle. And, and this, when you refuse to submit yourself to civilian authority, um, you are, actually going against this very basic cardinal principle of professionalism. And so you have military authorities also that do the purchasing, uh, that uh, manage finance matters. And, and when you look at those military uh, authorities, they, they, they show you what they want to show you and they hide whatever they want. So very often they, they, they usually report to the um, commander, the, the supreme commander of the armies, who is often the president. Um, so sometimes they do um, report to such an individual, but often they just hide things. So uh, this means that, that the parliament has a hard time uh, questioning uh, what they are doing. So the the you know regarding these, uh, this is a, a a block. The management procedures are often non-compliant with what has been set up. That what is supposed to happen. So administrative and financial. Um, those who, who manage those aspects uh, only report to the head of state. Like for example, in Kenya, there is a huge budget allocated to defense and security. In 2012, um, there was a requirement that these defense forces submit uh, these financial reports to the parliament as well as to the president. So this is, you know, a, a big problem. Now that's the first principle. So this this lack of subordination to civilian authority. Secondly, there's actually the fact um, that they're not adhering to neutrality, the political neutrality. What we see uh, right now is that security forces are becoming more and more political. Politicians are also militarizing themselves. So there's a, a cross factor there. So it's, so this lack of politicization 
is a problem in many countries. And this explains the uh, troubled civil military relations in, in many countries. It's like this. And I'm happy that um, we heard civil society mentioned civil society has become very is becoming very political i i think and and the coup d'etat that took place in burkina faso uh, was perhaps more organized by civil society than by political parties so these are aspects we must uh, consider when you have a, a situation where this this political interaction this creates uh, favorable conditions for the poor management of the security sector um, because there are things that are tolerated and, and this use of political resources by military leaders for their own personal enrichment. So in many countries, uh, a lot of decisions regarding the defense market, they're con concentrated within a military oligarchy. Um, that is allied to external commercial partners and, and internal as well. So procurement is determined by economic gain rather than to satisfy security needs. So parliamentarians must take this into account. Um, a, a general, uh, a former uh, defense minister in Mali, He, he wrote a book, and in this book, he said that within his country, the army is given three uniforms, three pairs of shoes, three pairs of socks every single year, despite the fact that they don't have enough food to, to, to feed this entire army. So this is the, the these, these procurements are really, um, enrichment cows for the military. Uh, so conditions are very difficult for parliaments, parliaments that are still dominated uh, in Africa by the party that's in power. So this is the, the last point before I use up too much time. It's the lack of expertise on the part of parliamentarians, I believe. Um, and that is a great difficulty and challenge that we must meet. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, Dr. Emil. Um, again, thank you, just like Dr. Michael, covering a lot of ground in a short amount of time, which is great. Um, I think um, you bring up uh, quite a few uh, challenges that you've explained in depth in relation to these principles of military professionalism. So let me ask you a second question. I'll also give you about seven minutes to reflect on this. So from your three past roles, military officer, parliamentarian, security minister, what are some lessons you can share about how we can strengthen the roles of parliaments to actually oversee the conduct and the ethics of the security services? Do you have suggestions about what parliaments can do? Thank you so much, Catherine. It is true that it is not easy. Yes, I was uh, in the military for 30 years and then uh, a parliamentarian. But what I recall the lessons learned, uh, the essential ones, there are several and I will speak of them. I think uh, Michael has mentioned them as well. It's the, it's the problem of the traditions in the security sector and I can speak of this, I can, because it's the lack of transparency in the security sector in the government, especially at the level of procurement. And this leads to uh, terrible results. And there's also a psychological cost and um, it, it, on individuals, it's a very complex problem. Then also the lack of information and transparency of information, of course, that is a real issue. 
So, of course, we have to protect the strategic interests of the country, but it is it is important to not use that as an excuse to avoid the transparency on procurement and on budget issues. What really um, worries me on a personal level is this tradition of secrecy and how it might actually impact on the real um, national security there. there. This is of concern to me. There is sometimes in my experience, I have seen that um, sometimes there's a lack of secrecy in matters that actually matter that need it. I don't see a country south of the Sahara, except for South Africa, that has the technical capacities to have nuclear weapons or chemical warfare. Um, so everything else, all the arms are purchased from mostly from Europe or elsewhere. So there's really nothing to hide. So in terms of the budget, the, it's uh, expenses, salaries, um, uh, material, equipment. Um, there really is no information that needs to be kept secret there, or protected because the military should know how many soldiers they have, uh, what the needs are to pay them and to um, meet their needs. And the army has the means to also uh, manage uh, these, uh, the needs of, of their personnel, of their soldiers. But then why is there so much secrecy concerning the, uh, the personnel needs and, this, and the, the, the salaries? Why? There are many phantoms. There are many, uh, there are many phantom uh, procurements that, that end up we don't know where. So there really is nothing to hide there. In terms of the budget for the, uh, the, the functioning itself, many, many, a lot of the budget is handled in a sort of automatic fashion. And in terms of the security sector, the, the changing threats, the threats are changing so rapidly that um, this causes a problem also. Uh, ministries of uh, Health and Ministries of Education, they can follow pretty automatic uh, budget, but in the uh, sector of defense and security, it, that's not possible. So to you, I mean, you have to also take into account, for example, budgeting the cost of fuel for trucks and planes. And so um, we can have the same budget over 10 years, but we know that the planes cannot fly if they don't have fuel and, and the cost of fuel change. So there's uh, equipment, material, goods. So it's not the it's, it's not, uh, it's the kind of procurement that is done often is material that is, uh, for example, to the, the clothing, uh, housing, uh, and, and food for the soldiers, something simply like a pair of socks that you can buy for, uh, a thousand uh, that you can buy for 3,000 francs and then it's procured for 30,000. It really it makes you wonder and think. So that is where there is corruption. So it's at the level of the uh, material that is for uh, the, the needs of the soldier. That's where you have corruption. But the base of the problem is that this, all the procurement 
is kind of programmed. And we wonder, why is all of this money given to this military oligarchy? Why are these expenditures under the control of just one entity? When you have such a large amount of money, there are no mechanisms in place to for oversight of the execution of the uh, expenditures. And the problem is that um, many of many countries don't have any uh, regulations in place that allow oversight of the budget that has been approved by law. So if you have a programming law, you, if you're given 2,500,000 uh, francs, uh, I say thank you, because there's no oversight after the fact. And so, as Catherine said, it's essential that parliamentarians have a process in place for oversight and you must do everything to also ensure that parliamentarians understand everything regarding to, to reinforce and strengthen oversight over the defense sector. Thank you so much, Dr. Emil. You spoke of many things today in terms of what parliamentarians can uh, focus on to continue their work in a much more efficient way, especially when one looks at the ecosystem within which they are working. I will also make note that Dr. Emil uh, works with us also on our programs on the development of national security strategies. There are many case studies where parliamentarians can also consult these resources on our website of the Africa Center uh, to better understand the things that he has been speaking okay. of. I'll switch back to English to ask Kemi her questions now. So Kemi, uh, we want to turn a bit more to police accountability specifically, and I know you have a wealth of experience here. So let me first ask for six or seven minutes, could you talk about the current state of police accountability and transparency in Nigeria, as well as some of the challenges that face parliaments um, that might be uh, trying to contribute to fostering police accountability, both for human rights, uh, upholding of human rights standards, but also fiscally. Uh, feel free to comment on either or both. Thank you. Um, so in country, we look at the um, state of police accountability, what we have is that we have multiple levels of accountability mechanisms, external to the police and also internal to the police. So external to the police, um, I would say you're looking at um, mechanisms that are looking at uh, accountability of the police as far as the conduct of the officers and men within the organization. You're looking at um, mechanisms that are looking at accountability of the officers and men and um, women, um, looking at their performance as far as control of crime, reduction of crime, um, tackling crime. So that will look at them on their on the basis of performance. Then we look at them on the on the budgetary um, component, accountability as per cost, accountability as per how they utilize the resources that have been given to them. Um, in 2020, um, we when we finally got a new police act. Um, and the struggle and the advocacy to get a new police act took over 14 years before we were able to get the act in 2020. 
that act looks at the possibility of bringing to play the internal and external mechanisms of the police under the accountability framework. The previous police act, one of the challenge we had with it is the fact that um, uh, it was a cake, it was colonial in nature because it was a 1944-45 um, act inherited by from the colonial masters. But one of the innovations, some of the innovations that the Police Act 2020 has brought onto the table, when you're looking at the element of accountability, so number one, you're looking at where is the responsibility of the Police Service Commission. So it states where the nexus is between the police and the Police Service Commission as per where they're working together. It also looks at the nexus between the Ministry of Police Affairs and the police. It looks at the nexus between the Nigerian Police Council and the police. Um, it also looks at the nexus of where the National Human Rights Commission comes in as an oversight mechanism for the police. Then it looks at the internal mechanisms of the police, trying to be more, um, making it a bit more clearer on the mandate of some of the internal mechanisms of the police. So for example, the Police Complaints Bureau, um, which is an internal mechanism for the police, which is looking at issues of incivility and engagement with members of the public. You have the police, the Complaints Response Unit, which is looking at, yes, also still looking at engagement with the members of the public, but in this way you can report police officers that have not done what you expect them to do to the complaint response unit. And then you have the traditional provost um, department within the police. Um, apart from this, on the outside at the external, we also have the judiciary because you have cases of police misconduct coming before the judiciary. And a good example, even though it's not the judiciary per se, is the, um, are the uh, tribunals. That were, sent, that were set up post the NSARS protest. So um, a decision was taken at the National Economic Council meeting um, headed by the vice president that states should set up um, tribunals to look at police misconduct within the state because of the, as an aftermath of the NSARS um, protest. And one of the things we saw, for example, in Lagos State is the fact that the attorney general came to the tribunal, and I think Ogo State at that time, with a list of cases that were already in court against police, erring police officers in relation to human rights violations. And one of the things that came out strongly is that there are times that the state case steps are being taken, but because the judicial process is so slow, and people, and there's no way, and, and they, they don't have a process where they proactively make certain information that might be of interest to the general public, put into the public space. Maybe they have a website that is periodically being updated so that even civil society organizations that are working on some of these issues can follow through on some of the cases. So it takes so long before decisions or judgments are given that members of the public have forgotten about it or think that nothing is happening. And so the, the distrust of the system um, continues. Um, then if we look at it with the, if I'm bringing it closer to home because of the topic um, that we're discussing today, which is um, the parliamentary oversight. One of the gaps that I've seen in recent times is that the external accountability mechanisms that I've mentioned and the internal accountability mechanisms, apart from engaging directly with the Secretary General of State, I do not think that the Parliament, particularly standing committees within Parliament that have um, critical, um, that have with, that have their responsibility of looking at the police, for example, engage with the complaint response unit to want to find out what are your challenges, how can we help you um, um, perform better or engaging with the National Human Rights Commission or calling a stakeholder um, um, committee or a stakeholder meets in a round table of ac other accountability um, mechanisms that also do looking at similar things and seeing how can we help you to do function better. Most times the discussions are always around the budget and what's the cost, you know, 
but other soft lower hanging fruits seem not to be areas of um, interest to the parliament. Thank you. Absolutely. I'll stop here. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Okunyoto. Thank you for um, giving us uh, this sense of the different external and internal um, you know, institutional mechanisms in the Nigerian context for relating it to the NSARS um, uh, developments in your country. And then um, I think what you've ended on here leads me into my second question for you. So based on the Nigerian experience you're describing here, what lessons do you think can be learned about ways parliamentarians can more actively oversee conduct, performance, and ethics of the police services? You've already started talking about some things that have moved the needle forward, but could you further elaborate on that for a couple of minutes? First, I think there's a need to understand the institution or the organization that um, you're going to be oversighted. You know, um, there are various resources and um, Michael and Emil has, um, they've touched on it. Um, a lot of times the resources available are not within the purview of the parliamentarians. That might not be, and I don't know how, I mean, from lessons looking at Nigeria as a case study, most times when parliamentarians are hiring aides, they do not look at the expertise of the aides. So most times you're comfortable, such positions are usually given to family members, relatives, cronies, you know. So the capacity to do intense research or the capacity to even to be able to source materials or information from the right, from appropriate sources might be lacking. So, for, uh, so we, engagement with civil society and think tanks, uh, academia cannot be overflowed. Um, two is also looking at this um, overwhelming party system. So you hardly find people, when people go in and this is the position of the executive because the executive is from my party, you tend not to over deny or ask questions. Whereas the difference between the parliament, between parliamentarians and the executive, I would say is that the parliamentarians are there by virtue of the constituency, even though we voted the others. But technically you are the representative of the people within the government structure. And so your allegiance should be to the people, feel the pulse of your people and know what they're asking, know what the, what the issues are. And these are the issues you put on the table and not wait until we have a breakdown of law and order within the system. And then you find parliamentarians talking same way as executives, you know, um, which is uh, a bit um, not expected. Then the other element of it is this one, we talk about the freedom of information and access to information. Um, and the oath of secrecy, the um, issue of you don't understand the defense and security sector, certain information is supposed to be secret, not to be put into the public space, continue to be a challenge, continue to be something that I think the defense and security actors continue to use in connivance with the executive, right, to blackmail others, including the parliamentarians. Um, so um, some years back when we had just recently passed our Freedom of Information Act in Nigeria, did some work for the, um, for the OSF to look at where, could be, where can we have the exceptions um, on the FOI um, and looking at the defense and law enforcement and security space. And one of the areas we look at is manpower. I do not, I, one would ask what is the secrecy in knowing how many men and women you have within the police, within the military, they are disaggregated as per age, disaggregated as per where they are serving, because this helps for proper planning, right? This helps you to know what you are, what you are procuring and for whom you are procuring. This helps you to know how you manage the health insurance packages because you know the people. So I, I, my submission for that piece of work is you start from the human beings. 
let's start from the human beings. Let's have proper records of the number of human beings, male, female, young, old, that are serving within the defense and security sector. Then we now move to what they need. Um, like Emil said, um, you're supposed to provide boots, you're supposed to provide um, uniforms and other related things. If you don't know the number of people, how do you make this provision? If you don't know the age cadre, how do you plan for retirement? How do you plan for health benefits? What kind of health benefits should they be having? And these are some of the, I think these are some of the low hanging fruit, which should not be threatening, that I think that um, parliamentarians can come through to ensure that there's effective oversight of the, um, of the defense and security um, sector. The, then it, at times, most of the time, when they call to have um, dialogues with the heads of these institutions, it's because there's an issue at stake. If there were a platform that is a periodic platform, that is an engagement platform that you know that it's on a quarterly basis. It's not until the um, people are up in arms or, or it's not until a part of the country seems to be burning and then we're asking, what are you doing about this? But it's an ongoing um, dialogue of a collaborative platform. Even if it's closed doors, then you find that maybe exchange of information would be easier exchange of information, most likely you build the trust over time. Um, and finally, I mean, we made that suggestion when we were trying to review the tenure and the process of appointment of the, uh, of the IG under the new police act, but it wasn't approved, is that maybe it would make sense that service chiefs and heads of military and paramilitary um, organizations should also pass through parliament when you're looking at approval process. They should also be made to come to parliament to give an idea of who they, what they want to do, what are their plans for the system and they can be vetted based on that. Um, it, it, it also makes them understand that they're not only um, answerable to the executive, which is one individual, but answerable to a government system. And the parliamentarians are also part of that system. Finally, lessons learned here is that we see situations where parliamentarians, or at times you find people in oversight responsibility, um, and this is an element of corruption, Getting contracts from the organizations you're supposed to be reciting. The minute you're getting awards, grants, contracts, um, supplementary, so maybe some form of support, um, you're supposed to be on oversight duties and it's the police providing the vehicles. The oversight has already been lost, you know. Um, and when I hear, I, um, I, I find it a bit challenging when I hear parliamentarians say they struggle with um, budgets or lack of funds. I'm like, you control. Ideally, you should be the ones approving the budgets, budgetary appropriation for the country. So how come you've not been able to put in place a good budgetary process for your own self to be able to perform your duty. Maybe it's linked to the fact that you do know you're, they do not appreciate what their duties are. And so have not been able to appropriate properly for them to be able to perform their own task also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kimmy. Lots of um, food for thought um, in terms of suggestions um, and your analysis of sort of places that parliamentarians could keep going. Um, and some of their work in relation to, um, uh, you know, reducing reactivity to crisis, setting up quarterly um, meetings, even when we're not in, in a tense situation, um, things related to freedom of information, um, engagement with national human rights institutions, this is a wide range, um, and then building informal connections as well. Um, this is a wide range of things um, that I think we'll continue discussing.
But next week is all about constituency service and building links to civil society as parliamentarians. So next week, we'll also build on what several of our speakers have alluded to, um, including Kemi um, in her last response to us here. So thank you so much, Kemi, and to all three panelists.